Have you bought your $3,000 virtual Atari shoes yet? That story as well as. High resolution color graphics. This land of high technology. The revolution in technology that made the information age possible. Those kids are not afraid of computers. The 27 year old PlayStation hack. Another one of a kind game unearthed in a field. Have your retro code judged by the greats. And Atari NFT sneakers. All this and our community question of the week on This Week in Retro. Up to date news for out of date tech. Whenever a new games console is released, the race is on to become the first hacker to find a way to get it to run software that it's not intended to run. For example, pirated copies, homebrew creations, or any type of unsigned code that the console doesn't, under normal circumstances, recognize as having been signed off by a trusted security certificate. The recognition that comes with being the first to jailbreak a new device is hard fought for and can both put you in jail and propel you into a career in the security industry. <laughs> sometimes even both. And it's because of this race to be the first that it's so unusual that the original PlayStation console has not until now received a soft mod that allows it to run such code without hardware hacking. Mod chips for the PlayStation have been, well, there have been many of them. They came out during the system's lifetime. They were sometimes installed by shadier retailers for a little bit extra cost when you bought your PlayStation. You could often get it modded with a hardware chip on the day before you even took it home. And more recently, there have been those FPGA-based mods such as the Sio, which I have in my own system. But this week, a developer by the name of Marcos Del Sol Vives, or Socrum8888, <laughs> released a soft mod method, a method of launching unofficial code with no hardware modification at all. Now, John, have you ever modified one of your own consoles using soft or hard methods? What's your history with console modding? You know, I haven't because I have no useful skills. I'm sorry. But <laughs> uh, I, I've been gifted several modded consoles. Uh, currently, I have a modded Wii, which is a lot of fun if you pair it up with some classic controllers. Uh, I also have an original Xbox modded with a front end called CoinOps. And let me tell you, this thing is incredible. Uh, I wasn't a fan of the original Xbox or its library at all, but with this mod, it turned from a pile of garbage into an incredibly capable emulation machine that could handle everything from the Amstrad all the way up through the Dreamcast. It's really incredible. How about you, Neil? Well, it's funny you should mention the Xbox because I think the first time that I soft modded a console, it was the original mm. Xbox. And... Um, the method this was achieved by was through replacing a couple of the system fonts. And these fonts were named Bert and Ernie. So that the hack, therefore, was known as the Bert and <laughs> I Ernie I love it. Box. What a name. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, the question is, how do you get new fonts onto a closed system like that? And, and this was a long time ago. So listeners can correct me if I'm remembering this slightly wrongly. But I think I used the game James Bond Agent Under Fire. And then I had a USB memory card reader for my PC so I could stick the Xbox's memory card in and, and um, save files onto it from the PC. So you'd load up a game um, and then you'd, you'd load a modified saved game file which I'd copied onto the card and that would cause the game to crash. And that's the first stage of most soft mods, finding a game that you can make crash in a predictable way. Uh, and when I say finding a way, I didn't find this way. This, this was documented and found by someone with much greater skills than me. So I was just following the instructions. And so you find a way to make the game crash in a predictable way, for example, by including a player name that's too long for the field, only to discover that the game has no checks against the string length. It doesn't concatenate it, so it just crashes the system. And um, it causes it to crash in a way that it carries on executing whatever code it then sees. So in the case of my Xbox, it would crash while playing James Bond. It would then load an alternative dashboard as part of that crashing process. I think it was called the Phoenix dashboard. Mm. And that included an FTP server. So now my Xbox has gone from playing James Bond to being on my network because it had a built-in network port with an FTP server running that I can log into from my PC and just drag and drop files onto. So we've got over the first hurdle of how do you get files on there. From there, you'd replace the system fonts the, with these Bert and Ernie fonts. And... Um, what you would oh and also a folder with a new dashboard on so what you would then do 
you would um, boot up the Xbox in the normal way. It had a hard drive in there with those new fonts now on there. It would display the regular Microsoft dashboard. And then when you go to a certain screen, I think it was the CD player in this case, it would load up those modified fonts, cause the dashboard to crash, cause it to fail over into the copied dashboard that we'd put on there. And all of a sudden, you've got your soft modded console. Every time you do that, you're into the dashboard. So that's an example of the kind of way you can you can soft hack a console for someone who hasn't done it before. And in the case of the Xbox, while I could run unsigned code in that way, I did have to physically swap out the DVD drive to another one that would then allow me to use copied DVDs. Mm. So, um, you know, there was a hardware element to it. So... Um, what did I do after that? Well, I sold it to a friend mm. because <laughs> after the thrill of the hack, the experience of owning a console then with a hundred or so games all on copy DVDs, um, it wasn't quite as enjoyable as having to squeeze every last ounce of enjoyment out of the three games that I could afford. Yeah, yeah, I think it's 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 a definitely it's definitely a case of you know one choice paralysis and something else something that i do all the time which is where you spend hundreds of hours setting up the perfect front end whether it's hyperspin or whatever you put in all the movies and you have all the all the cool themes and everything and then you're just like well it's time to move on to the next project and then you don't actually play any of the games um, my excuse to myself is that i say well once i have some people over then that they're really going to get wowed by this and of course they're not because they're used to awesome things being around them all the time so um i don't know that that kind of thing never really works out for me it's made me do a 180 uh from where the way i used to think about these sorts of things and i appreciate the simple text lists of the of the mister um now uh the with the xbox uh, yeah it's it's funny because um I believe that mine actually has both a swapped out uh, DVD drive and a swapped out IDE drive, uh, IDE hard disk, uh, and it's a special. You know, it's one of the ones where you have to keep the original one, but you swap out one that has all the games on it. But you have to keep that original just in case something goes wrong, because that's sort of the recovery drive for the for the thing. So, uh, it's it's definitely a complicated process. So, tell me more about this PlayStation mod, Neil. Does does this soft mod follow a similar process, or is it different? Yeah, so the new PlayStation mod is called um, Tony Hacks. That's hacks with an X because we're cool hackers oh, yeah. now. And uh, the Tony comes from the game Tony Hawk because Tony Hawk 2 and 3 uh, in the series, they found that it has a weakness in which saved games could be used to exploit and cause that same process of crashing and executing code. So very similar process to what we did on the Xbox. The PlayStation doesn't have a hard drive, of course, so you'd have to run Tony Hawk and, a lo uh, and, and load up a, a saved game every single time that you want to do this. Um, but, you know, you, you, you cause it to crash, then you put the copied CD in, and then it loads right up. So it is astonishing, really, that it's taken so long for a soft mod to appear for the PlayStation. I guess the prevalence of all of those cheap hardware mods, it really poured cold water on the race to be able to do it through software. Mm -hmm. And it's really nice that it exists now because it allows us to play backup games on a PlayStation without tampering with any of the hardware. It doesn't need a specific model of PlayStation with a parallel port or anything like that. It works on all of them, PAL and NTSC. So it's just great that it exists. You don't have to hack away at your hardware to do this. So the best place to find out more right now is by checking out a video by Modern Vintage Gamer over on YouTube. He's got a video where he explains it in great detail. He's very au fait with all this stuff. Great channel. And uh, he demonstrates the hack fully from start to finish. So go and check it out. Neil, first it was an abandoned R360 cabinet found in Ireland. Uh, now we've got our own bizarre arcade machine field find here stateside. Uh, according to an article in Eurogamer of all places, get ready. This is a mouthful. A Hyper Neo 64 Samurai Showdown 64, that's right, 64 twice, prototype has been found under a tree in a California field. Now, you may ask yourself, what is a Hyper Neo 64? Well, as a pretty big Neo Geo fan myself, I'd never heard of this. It turns out that the Hyper Neo Geo 64 was SNK's next generation Neo Geo platform. Uh, it was meant to bring the brand fully into the 3D era. Uh, unfortunately, the system flopped and only seven games were released and the project was scrapped just two years after its launch in 1999. Uh, Neil, are you familiar with the Hyper Neo Geo 64? Only really in name, John. I don't remember any arcades with this hardware appearing in my local arcade. 
Uh, and my local arcades were few and far between as we draw into the late 90s. Mm -hmm. But there are plenty of videos of this, um, of the games on this, in fact. And looking at some of those games, for example, there was one called Road's Edge. And it doesn't really hold a candle to say Sega Rally 2. So this is clearly a racing game of the same ilk, off-road racing. Sega Rally 2 came out in 1998. And in comparison to how this game looks, I would class the Neo Geo game as being more like Screamer Rally on the PC. The hardware, it doesn't really scream premium, cutting-edge arcade quality when put side-by-side side with Sega Rally and Sega's other efforts. So um, I would describe it as more like a decent PC of the time. Is that a fair assessment, would you say? Yeah, I mean, the, the Hyper Neo Geo 64 was really designed to bring the platform up to speed with the Model 3 arcade board from Sega, which was actually a couple years before this thing came out. So uh, ah, okay. if you look at a video of Samurai Showdown 64 from the video game Esoterica channel on YouTube, which we'll link to in the show notes, uh, it basically looks about the same fidelity and frame rate as Virtua Fighter 3. Right, right. So I probably picked a poor game for comparison, perhaps, uh, because Neo Geo, they're so well known for their fighting mm -hmm. games rather than their driving games. So in terms of fighting games, was it up there with Sega's hardware? Well, you know, the problem, as we all know, having the right hardware is only half the equation. Uh, the developers at SNK had spent the greater part of a decade, really almost two decades, fine-tuning their 2D engines for games like Metal Slug and King of Fighters. And I think what happened is one day management just kind of strolled in and said, all right, we're going 3D, go to it. And, uh, <laughs> you know, it's hard for developers to really, you know, hone those skills in a very short amount of time, especially when you compare all the work that Sega had been doing, refining their 3D engines and games like Virtua Fighter all the way back to like 1992 or whenever that game came out. So uh, now getting back to our find in the field, I guess this is the story. So uh, there was a pinball machine repairman named Craig Weiss, and he was called out to a house to work on a machine. And the machine was in really rough shape. Uh, it was in much rougher condition than most of the machines that he'd been called upon to work on. And so he asked the lady that owned it, uh, where did he, where did she get it from? And, and he was pointed to another woman whose husband owned a pinball machine and arcade vendor company that went out of business in the late 90s. So when he rolled up at this lady's house, he found the, uh, before him in the field just these old pallets of hardware sitting under a collapsed tree. I can't even imagine what was going through his head. You don't often find, you know, rotting pallets of video game hardware under a tree. Um, I guess what happened was that the owner of the business bought some pallets of SNK warehouse stock shortly before going out of business, and it had sat there in the open ever since. So Anyway, Craig made an offer to take this stuff off her hands and got in touch with another guy named Anthony Bacon. Uh, he runs a YouTube channel called Video Game Esoterica, who was able to place it in its proper historical context, made a whole video about it and all that stuff. So, Neil, surprisingly enough, this is the first time any kind of development board has been found for the Hyper Neo Geo 64. There were, you know, games have been found, but never a development board. So, it's pretty cool. Now... Neil, I know you're busy with the cave and all, but when are you going to start your RMC Treasure Hunter series? This is a new reality TV show I've placed you in where you take a metal detector and a boxed lunch and you rove about abandoned hedgerows looking for Amstrad action cover discs. <laughs> Well, it's probably best that we don't talk about what we what we would find in hedgerows in the eighties. <laughs> it was it was a treasure trove for young men. But uh, these are uh, these recent finds. They really do add that kind of gritty reality to the term digital archaeology, don't they? This is real metal detector and shovel stuff. You know, I, I <laughs> yeah, love it. There, I there's love definitely it. a couple hedge finds from my youth. I think are better left in the in the <laughs> past. Uh, but but leaving the greenery behind. Uh, have you ever found anything gaming related in a field or just in an abandoned location that you didn't expect? Yeah, kind of, kind of. In fact, my, my whole YouTube channel is really f founded on abandoned tech. Um, I used to work next to an electronics company that had a skip outside. That's a, that's a dumpster oh, for you, John. Okay, and. Uh, Every day when I walked to my car um, after work, I'd walk past this dumpster and I'd see what was in it. And I found a TRS-80 Model 100. There was a nice old Commodore calculator. There was a 486 PC over a period of several months. And I would quietly pick them out <laughs> and um, they would become videos on my channel in, in the very early days. But that's more dumpster diving than, than field archaeology. 
Um, I did also find a nice Sony CRT TV that you often see on my channel. That was just sitting by the side of the road, as was a Nintendo Wii, just sitting in the rain by the side of the road. So I've had a few really good alfresco finds. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How about you, John? Uh, unfortunately, no. Uh, although I have bought some games from pawn shops that looked like they'd been buried in the dirt for several decades. <laughs> uh, one of my most frequent daydreams as a child, you know, you're sitting in school and you're just dreaming these scenarios, was to be running around in a field and then come across the secret buried treasure of video games. The story in my mind was always like you'd have this kid and his mom would be like, that's it. That's enough with the video games. Throw them all out now. And he's like, well, I'll just bury them and I'll come back to them later. And of course, who should stumble along? Long, but me, that never happened, Neil. I never, I never found the, the the treasure trove of video games. But you know, I'm keeping the dream alive. Anyway, there's still time. Yeah, if you haven't <laughs> seen Anthony's video series on the Hyper Neo Geo 64, it's well worth a watch. And uh, we'll just have to see what rare gaming artifact will be unearthed, uh, literally next. Now, John, we owe our listeners an apology. What did I do this time, Neil? Uh, it's not you, John. It's definitely me this week. So do you remember we launched the RetroRewind.ca competition last month in which you could win the RGB2 HDMI module for your Amiga computer? Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, well, um, I was supposed to promote it last week so that everyone have a, a chance to enter, and I totally forgot. So I'm sorry, everyone. So what I'm going to do is I'm going <laughs> to extend the competition by one more week just to keep it fair, and here's what you have to do. If you want to win this fabulous mod from RetroRewind.ca to pop into your Denise slot on your Amiga computer and get a really quick and easy HDMI output with a quality unlike any upscaler or alternative options that you've seen out there, this really is a great bit of kit. All you have to do is go on Twitter and tell us how you're listening to the show today and use the hashtag ThisWeekInRetro. So hashtag ThisWeekInRetro, all one word, and that will allow us to find your entries. Yeah, yeah. So one more time, that's hashtag This Week in Retro, and we'll pick the winner of our great RetroRewind.ca giveaway and announce them on next week's show. If I remember. <laughs> if Neil remembers. <laughs> and, uh, and a big thank you to RetroRewind.ca for being a wonderful sponsor. Please do check out their store, and if you do decide to get a little something for yourself, you can save 10% off your order by using the code TWIR10. John, if I say the names Eugene Jarvis, Jeff Minter, and the Oliver Twins, what thoughts or memories do they evoke for you? Old blokes constantly trying to cash in on their old IPs with each <laughs> new generation of systems. Oh, wait. Am I, am I talking out loud, Neil? I mean, I mean, titans of the computer industry who got their start from humble beginnings. Is that what you think, too? That's right. That's right. <laughs> yes. Yeah. We've got a couple of brick coders there, bedroom coders from the golden age when bedroom coders could rule the world. And Eugene Jarvis, the creator of Defender, Robotron, and many more classic arcade games. And these are the people that are going to be on a panel to judge your code in a new retro game development competition shared on our subreddit by listener Shishakli. So mm -hmm. thank you for sharing that story with us. The competition is based around a bit of software called Fuse. That's F-U-Z or Z-E, which is for the Nintendo Switch. Now, I was fortunate enough to have a, a secretive hands-on with Fuse before it was released a couple of years back when I met the developer, John, by chance at an expo. And he was kind enough to show me. Um, and then we recorded a tea break together to find out a lot more about it ready for launch. And it, it really is a lovely piece of software. I'd liken it to many old school game creation tools like Shoot 'em Up Construction Kit in its ease of use, and it has a nice library of assets that comes with it that you can just drop in, including artwork from the Dizzy Games with permission from the Oliver Twins. And then underneath all of that razzle dazzle is a nice coding environment where you can create all of the mechanics for your game. So, John, does the sound of that float your boat? Do you fancy a bit of Switch development? Well, I, I'm a better critic than I am a creator, Neil, and, and really I'm not that good of a critic. So uh, okay. I, I do think this kind of software is invaluable, it's, it, not only for game creation, but just as an educational tool for aspiring game creators out there to get a sense of just how hard games are to create even with simplified rule and tile sets with programs like Fuse, uh, even if they never go beyond that basic first step, it just gives them an appreciation for all the work that goes into the games that they enjoy. Um, of course, this could also be a catalyst for aspiring programmers to become even more immersed in the scene and step up to, to more complex languages. Um, who is this aimed at, Neil? Yeah, so you mentioned aspiring programmers there. Anyone can use Fuse, of course, but they are mm -hmm. trying specifically to attract those young aspiring coders and, and inspire them to explore 
coding and perhaps hook them into taking it up as a hobby or even an occupation. And games really are the perfect way to do this. I, I know as a kid that I started with games. I, I, I never stopped with games, but it started with <laughs> games. And then my mind would wonder, to, well, how do you make these games? And you'd normally follow the path of least resistance. So you would go with something like shoot 'em up construction kit or pinball construction set or the quill if you wanted to make a text adventure because they were easy points of entry. And that might satisfy you. Or like me, you might find you start to hit the limitations of that software. And then you look for something more powerful, an, an Amos on the Amiga, a Stoss uh, on the uh, Atari, maybe Blitz Basic. And then before you know it, you've progressed to C or C++. And um, you know, I'm talking back in the 80s and 90s here. And, and, and my own progression, I'm not advocating that we put Stoss in schools today. Um, <laughs> but that kind of path will be familiar to many listeners, that that, that first step from gamer to coder. It, it's the most important step of them all because it's very easy to intimidate a young coder with too much information too quickly and with too little support or documentation. So, um, or, or even coding examples, they're really, really important, nicely commented uh, and well-documented coding examples. And Fuse seems to have found, found a nice balance while also putting it on the Nintendo Switch. And that's super appealing to kids because you don't want to create games that run on a big old boring desktop PC. I'm, I'm sure the kids these days don't want to do that. They want to see it running on the same hardware that they play their regular games on. Yeah, yeah. I mean, to be honest, there's already tons of game creation tools and programming courses for kids on the PC. Um, you know, there's Scratch and a bunch of other things like that. But having your game run on the same platform that runs Mario Odyssey or Breath of the Wild, I mean, that's a real treat, uh, especially mm -hmm. one of Nintendo systems as they've never really been known for, uh, shall we say, open architecture. So uh, let's talk more about this Fuse competition. What are the rules? Well, the rules are very few. In fact, um, you have to create your own game. There will be loads of prize categories. They haven't been specified yet. They've just said there'll be lots of them. So lots of chances to win something. There are no age limits at all and, and anyone can enter. So <laughs> it's it's very <laughs> wide, wide open. So get your kids involved. Uh, maybe write a game yourself. Maybe work together. Whatever takes your fancy. This is a great opportunity to find out if your kids like programming and get your code in front of some real industry legends uh, to, to be rated and to get some feedback from them. Check out fuse.co.uk to find out more or find links in the show notes. This next story is, well, it's weird, Neil. Um, it comes to us from This Week in Reddit subreddit user Pajaco6502. Now, Neil, would you consider yourself to be a sneakerhead? Um, only if they have inverted crucifixes and human blood in the soles of them. <laughs> did, you, did you see that sneaker story? Um, no, no. So I don't know why I'm saying sneaker. We say trainers here. Sneakers are very American word. But um, I, I, I can't believe I missed that story, Eniel. It, it didn't cross my radar. So, so okay. tell me more. Okay, so this was a, a pair of sneakers this week. <sighs> sneakers, trainers this week, sold by <laughs> the rapper that we both love to listen to, Lil Nas X. You listen to him all day, don't you, John? I know just that. all day, constantly. All day. <laughs> and he called them Satan shoes. So, um, yeah, unless your story is about to take us, uh, you know, down the history of the occult, then I, I think I'm barking up the wrong tree. I think I've taken up the wrong shoe story. Tell us about your story. <laughs> that, they, uh, that story will be in our follow up podcast, <laughs> Trainer Talk. Look for it never. Uh, now, I'm sure that you've heard about non fungible tokens or NFTs. They, they've become quite a hot commodity as of late as people with probably more money than cents are posting insane sums to own virtual editions of artwork, snippets of sports plays, and all kinds of other shenanigans. Well, Atari, never one to let a good trend go to waste, is jumping into the NFT game with, get ready for this, Neil, Atari NFT sneakers. Oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> sneakers that one, you can't actually wear, and two, don't actually exist. These virtual sneakers come in a whole range of colors and styles that you can show off to your friends through Snapchat. Yep, you read that right. Uh, you take a picture of yourself with, I guess, sock feet, and then you use Snapchat's AI, and the AI puts the virtual shoes on your virtual feet. <laughs> Am I selling you on this, Neil? Uh, there are words that I want to say that I can't say on a family-friendly podcast right now, John. Um, <laughs> you know, so, someone sat in a boardroom somewhere and they said, you know that story of the emperor's new clothes? 
<laughs> How can we monetize that? And here we are as a result of that, buying non-existent virtual clothes, not even for our in-game characters, but for ourselves. Um, <laughs> yeah, John, I'm going to go out on a limb and say anyone who buys this stuff is an idiot, John. <laughs> is that too harsh? Am I missing something? Can you convince me that I'm wrong? Well, if you're looking for good, you're going to have to look further because you're not <laughs> going to find it here. Uh, you may be asking yourself, what kinds of prices are these virtual sneakers going for? Ten bucks? Fifty bucks? No. Uh, these, quote, cyber sneakers that, quote, bend realities have sold for 3000 freaking dollars. Now, don't get me wrong. These shoes do look pretty neat. You can see the entire range with the link in the show notes, but it just seems odd to me that these virtual shoes could command such a high price tag. I, I mean, I must be the only one who thinks that, though, since uh, the studio that made these, they're called RTFKT Studios. Uh, they created and sold a pure gold digital sneaker. Now, uh, this is a pure gold fake thing that's not gold at all. $28,000. $28,000. I mean, when you consider what a real solid gold sneaker would cost, I guess that's that's quite a bargain. It's like they're paying you to take it away for only twenty eight grand. Neil, maybe I'm being too hard on these NFTs. Maybe this is an opportunity for both of us to create this week in retro non-fungible tokens. What do you think should be our first digital collectible? <laughs> You're being sucked into this whole idea, John. I can see dollar signs spinning in your eyes as you think about it. All of the make-believe things that you might be able to sell. Um, you know, when I was a kid, a very young age, there is a connection to this story. The highlight of the month at school was when the council appeared, um, appeared on the playing field with a big sit-on lawnmower who'd drive up and down the field cutting the grass. And at lunchtime, we'd all run out and scoop up the grass and we'd, uh, we'd make grass houses and we'd barter jumpers full of grass with each other. Sounds like Lord of the Flies, Neil. Don't judge me. Yeah, yeah. I grew up in the countryside. I don't know what you guys did in the cities, but this is what us country bumpkins did as kids. And... Uh, <laughs> I put it to you, I put it to you that a school jumper filled with cut grass is worth more than a pair of virtual gold running shoes. Ridiculous, <laughs> ridiculous. So that's what I'm offering you as an NFT. A virtual child's jumper filled with freshly cut grass for, um, let's say, £100,000 as a starting price. That's a great idea. It's time to get rich, <laughs> Neil. <laughs> oh, and if you bought, dear listener, a pair of those $3,000 virtual Atari shoes, please reach out to us on our show subreddit and show them off on your virtual feet. No, just just unsubscribe. We don't want you here. <laughs> <laughs> We're drawing the line there. We draw the line with the NFTs. So, John, last week's community question of the week now, and it was, what development studio would you like to see come out of retirement to produce a new game for a retro computer or console? John, what did our subreddit users have to say? Uh, let's see. Our highest upvoted entry comes to us from Mark Pierre, and he says, The Bitmap Brothers. Was there ever really anyone else who you bought their games sight unseen just on the strength of that logo name? What do you think, Neil? Were you in, in the Bitmap Brothers Club? Yeah, I mean, they were uh, always very glossy games, nicely packaged, often had great music, you know, things like Xenon 2 and Magic Pockets and Gods, wonderful th soundtracks. Um, the games didn't always live up to that gloss and shine, but, you know, eight out of ten times you got a good game with them. I think they were pretty good. Mm, mm. Yeah, yeah, so I think that's a strong choice. Um, the next answer was from Line of Seven, Line of Sevens, and uh, Peak of Their Game, epics uh, a new release was an insta buy what do you think yeah about I, i'm much more on the epic side of things than i am the bitmap brothers i find the, the bitmaps to be fairly overrated but epics is a big fan of the games series of games summer games california games uh i love almost everything that they did so get put put me on team epics did they publish Impossible Mission or was that US they did. Gold? They did. Yeah, they did. Yeah. So, yeah, lots of great games. You do instantly go to California games when you think Epics, but they did do lots of other great releases as well. Yeah. Also, original developers of the Lynx console, too. So, lots of, oh, of, lots of great stuff were, going yeah. on over there. Yeah. yeah until yeah. until they went out of business like everybody else. Yeah. 
Finally, Jeremy's Retro Bar is our final answer of the week. He says, definitely Sierra for me, especially if it was done with the old SCI engine, but the later VGA point and clicks so you don't have to fudge with commands. I think their name is still used on things like the newer King's Quest series, but having old school Roberta Williams, Al Lowe, Jane Jensen, the Coles, two guys from Andromeda, and Jeff Tunnel making new games would be incredible. What do you think about that, Neil? Well, I mean, Sierra has had a great stable of developers and um, all of those wonderful franchises. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think sometimes you can get a little bit misty eyed and um, nostalgic for those old, uh, the early SCI engine where you had to actually mm -hmm. type in commands. Mm -hmm. And actually it was the source of a lot of frustration back then. Let's, let's not gloss over it. I did prefer the newer point and click VGA versions of it personally. But yeah, yeah I think that there's de there's definitely a sweet spot between the two. Uh, I, I myself, I'm, I've always been more of a LucasArts guy because I find that death comes too easily and exploration mm. is not really rewarded as it is punished in some of those older games. Um, but there is there is a certain amount of charm in having to navigate both the cursor arrows and the text parser uh, in, in very limited quantities, I would mm. say. And Jeff Tunnel also um, responsible for the Incredible Machine. Love that game. Mm. So for that oh, yeah. alone, I'd like to see Jeff back. Yeah. So great answers. Now, this week's community question of the week goes back to one of our stories from last week, where Germany signified the demo scene's place in cultural history. Uh, the question is, what video game art or music would you like to put in a museum for all to enjoy? So, please post your responses on the show subreddit, and we'll read the top three most upvoted responses on next week's show. This Week in Retro was presented by Neil from RMC and John Shawler. It was produced by me, Duncan Stiles. The podcast version of the show is available through your favorite podcaster, including Apple Podcasts and Spotify. And the video version is available on the This Week in Retro YouTube channel. Join our community subreddit at r slash This Week in Retro to suggest and vote on stories we cover on the show. If you watch This Week in Retro on YouTube, please give us a like and subscribe to help us reach new viewers. If you'd like to support the show, please check out the links to our Patreon and Coffee pages in the show notes or in the YouTube description. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week for more up-to-date news for out-of-date tech.